Welcome to Warfare, Advancement, and Revisionism. My name is Preston Floyd, and as always, I am your host. So, this week we have a special bonus episode. Um, I know I said I wasn't going to do one this week, but I was able to finish up my preparations for the 4th of July a lot earlier than I initially planned. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and record this before I leave and have it ready to go and have it set to automatically publish uh, on the 4th, that Monday, at a regular time. Um, and while that's posting, I'll be sitting by a pool drinking copious amounts of adult beverages. So, uh, this is just going to be a really little short kind of bonus episode revolving around the movie 10,000 B.C., uh, it is a 2008 film uh, written by Roland Emmerich. He was also the director on this one. And what a film it is. Um, <laughs> so, um, I'm just going to say it. This is not a good movie. Um, it's it's bad. Um, yeah, it, it, it's not good. Um, now, that's not to say it's the worst movie ever made. It's not. Um, it's a very subpar, gene generic, action-esque movie. Um, and when you want to talk about historical inaccuracies, uh, which is what I'm going to be doing here since that's kind of the point of the podcast, <laughs> at least to an extent... Um, there's a lot to go over here. Um, so, yeah. Uh, let's just go ahead and start on this bad boy. Um, so, this was released in 2008 on March the 7th. And it uh, actually made money. It was actually a fairly big uh, hit. I think it cost about $105 million to make. And it made about $270 million. So it was it was a financial success, uh, but I think it is considered, or it was considered, one of Roland Emmerich's worst movies until he made <laughs> Moonfall. Um, well, I guess technically it was considered his worst movie, probably until the Independence Day sequel. Uh, I forget I forget what even what that was called, but. Um, and then, of course, he made Moonfall, which is probably going to be his last movie, if I'm completely honest. Um, there are no big stars in this. Um, there, It's kind of an ensemble cast. There is a main actor, uh, Stephen Strait, and a main female lead, Camilla Bell. And then there's, I guess, the third billing is a actor by the name of Cliff Curtis. You would recognize him. He may not be the biggest name actor, but he's been in over, I believe, 60 movies and TV shows. And he usually plays like a number two man or kind of a, um, you know, maybe like a high-ranking, uh, um, a high-ranking, uh, bad guy like in a criminal organization he's usually like the number two or three or he's like the buddy to uh one of the the main heroes um he i think his biggest role that i remember him from are uh he was in training day and he's also in dr sleep which was the uh, the shining sequel that came out uh was it i believe three years ago at this point yeah two, 2019 is when it came out um and he's and he's the best actor in it by far he's not a bad actor by any by any stretch of the imagination he's just he's rarely allowed to kind of be the star and he's fairly underutilized even in this film um it is narrated however by omar sharif which was a big pull um I imagine a lot of the budget uh, went to, um, you know, went to that uh, hiring. Uh, in fact, this may have been his last movie that he was involved with. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that, but um, at the very least, he it was his last voice role. He doesn't appear on screen at all. Uh, so, uh, to kind of give a brief 
uh, overview of the movie. We focus on a tribe in what I'm assuming is the Ural Mountains uh, in what is now Russia and Kazakhstan. And this tri is, tribe is called the Yagal. They are led by uh, a woman who's initially called uh, Wise Mother, Old Mother, Wise Spirit. They kind of refer to her different things. Um, and this very strange thing about this film, they don't really go into too much detail aside from the very beginning in the narration. They say that she's the last of her kind. Um, so I'm assuming she's meant to be a Neanderthal. Uh, they really don't go into it. Uh, but at the start of the movie, you're treated to her kind of looking at this young girl with blue eyes. Uh, and the narration provided by Omar Sharif is basically saying how she's important and how the story of the blue-eyed child will begin and live on. Uh... And essentially, the old woman kind of gives a prophecy, essentially, uh, that this young girl has come to tell them about four-legged demons and how uh, soon they will have their last uh, mammoth hunt. Uh, and then, I guess, the, the hero of that hunt will become the leader of their people and that he will see them through uh, these times of hardship to uh, a place where they will never have to worry about food or starvation again. And that the leader of that group will marry the girl. Uh, the girl's name is Evelette. I'm assuming that they thought that that was kind of a uh, witty way to kind of link her with Eve. I, I don't know. Uh, there is, however, another um, leader among the Yagal, and that is their chief. Uh, he doesn't kind of he doesn't believe this prophecy, so he wants to try to he wants to try to find a quicker and more efficient way to save his people. He leaves behind his son uh, and gives his white spear. Uh, to his friend, the aforementioned Cliff Curtis. Uh, this white spear is very important. It is the symbol of leadership in the Yagal tribe. Uh, his son is Delay, as his uh, is his name, and that's D apostrophe L E H. Uh, and speaking of supposedly smart or witty naming conventions. That is the German word Held, which is, barring my poor pronunciation of that, the German word for hero. So, yes, he is hero spelled backwards. Very smart, Roland Emmerich. Uh, so, uh, because he abandons the tribe... Uh, and also, I should point out that he doesn't want anyone to know why he's left. He, he just gives his fear, uh, spear to uh, Cliff Curtis's character and they don't tell anyone I'm leaving. Uh, he doesn't want to split the tribe, which I actually think is a decent reason for him to, you know, to want this hidden from people. Uh, he, he doesn't want, because he he's knows that if he leaves, there's going to be people that leave with him, but he doesn't want to leave the tribe, you know, in terrible shape. He wants them to survive, and so, so he kind of chooses to sacrifice, you know, his safety and his comfy leadership position to go and try to bring a quicker uh, solution to their problems back. Um so he leaves the spear to Cliff Curtis's character, who they named Tick Tick. Uh, yes, you heard that correct, Tick Tick. Um, anyway, <laughs> so, um, and he becomes the new leader, and he, he kind of doesn't tell anyone. He kind of holds it back, and that causes problems for Dila. Uh, or, I'm sorry, Delay. Uh and he's uh, kind of picked on and ostracized by his younger 
group mates, uh, specifically Kyren, who is kind of the alpha young man who is kind of like the best hunter in the tribe. Uh, but, you know, uh, because he's alone and ostracized, uh, Evelet and Delay kind of slowly fall in love over the years. And then the time comes, uh, you have a big uh, time skip, a few years, and it's time for the mammoths to return to the valley. And, of course, the, uh, the wise woman, the old mother, tells Tick Tick to not kill the... Um, mammoths himself with the white spear it has to be one of the young hunters who will then assume power and marry Evelet and become the new leader um the hunt is uh is a success they do get one mammoth and of course during that delay is the one to kill the mammoth however he does this by accident. He kind of accidentally gets his spear stuck in the ground, and while the mammoth is charging him, it falls into the spear and kill, basically kills itself. Uh, and also, Delay does not really work as a, as a team with the rest of the tribe because he desperately wants to make sure that Evelet does not have to marry anyone but him. Uh, so they have a little uh, celebration, they're cooking their meat, and uh, he eventually decides that he's not worthy and chooses to step down. However, before, you know, before too much happens in the story, their village is raided by horse raiders. Uh, they attack the camp, they kill a bunch of people, they enslave more, and basically all that's left is... Uh, uh, Delay, Tick Tick, Kyren, and a young younger boy who kind of is in there uh, called Baku. His mother is killed in the raid, and he follows after them when they go and try to save their uh, people. Um, and the old mother stays behind, uh, kind of leading the remnant while they go and try to save everyone. Uh, along the way, they have... You know, they have problems. They have to face terror birds, um, is what they're basically referred to, um, which I forget which specific breed of those they are. It's like um, Foro Shiroko or something like that. I, I forget the exact name for them, but they're referred to as tether, terror birds. They also have to face a, uh, a Smilodon uh, saber-toothed tiger. Then they meet a group of uh, sedentary farmers, and then they have their own prophecy where uh, essentially someone who spoke to uh, the spear tooth, the saber tooth tiger, will help them free their people. Um, and of course, the uh, Smilodon that Delay had met uh, and helped save from drowning. Uh, he shows up and kind of vouches for them, for lack of a better term. Uh, so this kind of gets this group to decide to help uh, Delay and the others. Uh, and they kind of get a coalition of tribes together to break up this uh, slave ring. Uh, and then they go to the location everyone's been taken. And they are watching as... The, their peoples are being whipped and abused, and mammoths are being harnessed to build the pyramids. Uh, yes, that is correct. The, the Egyptian pyramids are the reason for this. Uh, and eventually they are able to kind of infiltrate the slave group and sneak them in weapons and coordinate a plan with them. And then they have a big slave uprising where they kill the... Um, the God, the Almighty, as he's referred to by his servants, uh, and they are able to break free and uh, basically save everyone, and they all go back to their uh, old lives. And then, of course, by the time Delay and his people get back to their valley, uh, the, the climate has changed, and now crops are, or you know, wild grasses are growing. It's so green and verdant and you know, it's it's growing so fast. Um, 
Also, uh, I forgot to mention it because it's it's a big part of the very end of the movie. Uh, Evelet is shot by an arrow during the fighting, and she kind of sort of dies. But then the old woman, who's somehow psychically linked with her, is able to kind of give up her own life to make sure that Evelet is saved. So yeah, um, uh, so they live happily ever after. Um, and that's the movie. Um, so where to begin with this? Um, as an action movie, it's not the worst thing I've ever seen. As a high fantasy movie, it has some decent ideas. It is just not executed well at all. Uh, to be specific. You know, to kind of go into it, like the the old Neanderthal woman being somehow psychic and uh, able to communicate with nature. Um, would have been cool to kind of get into a little bit more of that. Uh, play up the fantasy elements, to be quite honest. Make it seem like kind of an origin myth or an actual story about the blue-eyed child, which is what Evla is, by the way. Um, as for the action stuff... Honestly, they could have cut down on some of the terrible CGI that they used in this movie and tried to do a little bit more practical effects, but uh, that's just my personal opinion. I know some people don't mind CG as much, um, but the CG in this is not great. There are some good scenes, but like there's a scene at the start of the movie where this is supposed to be like sunset on like an open Siberian desert or tundra, and you can tell it's just superimposed over the actors on a green screen. Which is weird because they did do some on-site stuff that actually looks okay. So a very odd choice altogether. Um, also, um, the the Almighty, the God King, uh, he is said to have arrived uh, from his, his homeland with two others after it sunk beneath the waves. Hint, this is supposed to be Atlantis, um, and you know he's the only one remaining. Uh, what happened to the other two? They really don't go into it. Um, yeah, the, why is he? Why is the God King so set on getting these temples built? Uh, they really, again, do not go into any detail on this. And Evelet is supposed to be like she has like this birthmark or scars that are like the North Star. And this is kind of the only thing that the the Almighty fears. And then when he finds out about it, he kind of he knows that this is going to bring the hunter that's going to bring him down. So he tries to get you know that's basically kind of like the big standoff at the end of the movie. It's um it's weird choices, and they had like a lot of ideas. I felt like they could have focused a little bit more on some other stuff. Um, it's like. So they, they, I feel like they really wanted to play up the whole Atlantis people coming and being the founders of Sills. Like basically playing up the like Chariot of the Gods and the Graham Hancock, like Atlanteans in America or like in the ocean, like, you know, f f spreading out and like colonizing and kind of laying the seeds of civilization all around the world. Um, but they didn't really do any of that. So it's like a much less interesting Graham Hancock, which is also not historically accurate, much like this movie, but it is, it is Graham Hancock stuff is at least interesting. It's a nice thought experiment, um, if nothing else. Uh, so yeah, this has like half baked ideas from that and then just poor execution of the study of history. Um, I'm going to go through a big list I came up with, and these are other criticisms I've seen from the movie. Um, specifically, um, the tribe itself is made up with some, you know, like uh, there are indigenous actors, there are um, Polynesians in here, they have Brazilian actors, uh, they have, you know, just your standard, you know, uh, European white person in here you have uh, in the tribes in the south when they're kind of following along the slave raiders you see that there are plenty of Africans uh, and different you know there are different types of African tribes there are um, 
there's one tribe, the Naku, the ones that they are waiting for the person that can speak to the saber tooth tire. Uh, tiger they have scarring they practice scarring on their people you they run across a group of pygmies they run across a group that joins their coalition that appear to be nilotic they're very very dark skin uh, and they use bone kind of um jewelry and um ornamentation like body modification uh, stuff that's you know very different so the african tribes actually look different to each other now whether it's accurate to where these people are supposed to be no probably not at all but it is interesting that they went through the effort to differentiate these tribes and they're not just all you know african or, or black or whatever um that being said uh, the main character and Evelet are too white compared to everyone else. In fact, the um, the main tribe, they don't really, you know, it's nice that they're, you know, meant to be kind of representative of the people who they will become is what I think they were doing. But, you know, they don't really look like one another. They all kind of have different... A little bit different clothing they don't have the same homogeneity homogeneity that the other tribes do and it's really kind of off-putting uh, but yeah to go back through the the list of inaccuracies they are most most of the main cast are a little too white for this point in time lighter skin has started to develop as you get away from the equator and the tropics and you get more towards the poles, that's going to happen over time. Uh, with less direct sunlight, this is a, a theory of why lights can develop. Um, with less direct sunlight, um, you don't need as dark skin to block the like solar UV rays, um, and you need more vitamin D, depending on where you live, if like you're not getting it from your environment, which where they were living on the steppe, you probably were having issues getting enough vitamin D, at least initially. And because of that, you know, you needed to let a little bit more of that sunlight in. Uh, so, yeah, you, you have an issue with melanin production. That's, that's like a, that's a mutation. Um, that being said, they're still fairly dark dark skinned uh they you probably like consider them very very swarthy kind of like uh southern european like if they were out the sun all the time they would have very brown tan skin their hair would be brown as well their eyes um and that's kind of one of the big things with evelet she has she has blue eyes this is also a mutation uh based on a lack of melanin um, green eyes, of course, are a thing. Hazel as well. So there's a big jump off point. At one point, we all had brown eyes as you move out of Africa and or you move north or south, you begin to see uh, mutations for hazel and then green probably yellow rose after that. Uh, and blue eyes actually don't show up. I think they've, from what we can tell so far, Blue eyes don't actually start until about 8,000 BC at the earliest, um, and that's a guess. It could be much. It could be could not happen until like 6,000 BC, I think. So blue eyes are way too early. Um, so yeah, so or at least for what we have a record of. Uh, unless Evelyn didn't have any children and she didn't pass it down and someone else just developed a bit uh, randomly later. Um, so that's another big issue. Skin and eye color not being possible. Um, another thing, uh, saber-toothed tigers, Smilodon. Uh, extinct in Europe at this point and uh, Asia too. I think it's only around in North America, in fact. Um... In fact, I think Smilodon itself was only in North and South America. It, there were other saber-toothed cats in Europe and Asia, but they they were not Smilodon. And I think most of those were 
extinct at this point. Maybe not in North America, but uh, in Europe and Asia, they were probably gone. Um, how they hunted mammoths, also inaccurate. That's not how they would do it. They would probably... They, they get up and they, like, stab them directly. That's that's insane. They would never do that. They would definitely just throw spears at them. Um, maybe try to get elevation on them. Drop spears down, rocks. Anything to kind of injure and cause the, the mammoth to bleed out. Or, you know, kind of cause them to stampede off, the, off a cliff is another possibility. But um, another big problem with this film, uh, horseback riding. Um... We are not taming the horse for a few thousand years. And much, what's more is uh, the horses we're taming are not able to be ridden by humans. At least initially. That's something that kind of comes along later after we develop the technologies to kind of help control them. And we raise them to be bigger and more uh, hardy. Um, and then of course there's the pyramids. Uh, that's a big jump. Uh, pyramids are not going to be built for another couple of thousand years, and yet this is one of those things that's like, uh, the pyramids are actually older, and the Egyptians just took them over and re-kind of did some stuff, um, to, you know, basically take over this, this Atlantean relic, is essentially what I think they're saying. Um, Atlantis, if there was some type of civilization that is lost... Uh, it was in Atlantis. Um, there may have been... I'm sure there have been lost civilizations that we don't know anything about. Uh, but it was not Atlantis. The Egyptians invented their pyramids. Um, and we'll get into that in the future. I don't want to go into too much detail about this. Especially in a bonus episode that might everyone might not listen to. But uh, yes, that is very, very inaccurate. Uh also, the Sphinx is just a lion. I guess they're going to say that they're going to redo that to kind of chisel it as a human. Um, what is another one? Ah, yeah, there are chili peppers. Uh, they feed chili peppers to delay. Um, chili peppers do not reach Europe and Africa until, of course, uh, the Columbian Exchange happens. Um, and they're not even... They don't even look like that at that point in the New World. They're much smaller. That's something that kind of develops later as we kind of practice agriculture on those uh, devices. Oh, and also, there's agriculture. They, you know, <laughs> this this tribe uh, that uh, kind of takes Delay and the others in, the first group that they meet, they're agriculturalists. Uh, at 10,000 B.C., that is not something that's happening just yet. Uh, we're just kind of in the proto stages of even getting to that point. Um, so that's another inaccuracy. Now, I know that this is, you know, it's it's very nitpicky. And, you know, you're like, okay, so the movie's historically accurate. Is it really supposed to be accurate? Um, not necessarily, but I think if you're not going to do, you know, a historical historically accurate movie don't call it 10,000 BC just make it like a high fantasy thing something like Conan um, you can do good historically accurate movies we saw that with um, uh, Alpha that was a very good movie and while everything in it is not 100% it gets most of it right um, and Quest for Fire that it, you know Again, we're talking about, um, there are some inaccuracies with that, um, but they're also kind of supposed to be not human. They're more Neanderthal, and they're kind of running up against the first Homo sapiens when they go and get fire, uh, kind of show like a initial meeting and uh, eventual inbreeding, of course, if you've watched the whole movie. So, uh, 10,000 BC, wasted potential, start to finish, Actors do okay. I mean, there's there's not any bad acting, at least from any of the main cast. Um, and I think a lot of the extras, they did their best, or the side characters, but there just wasn't a lot for them to work with, um, honestly. I think I think this is kind of really the, the start of the end for Roland Emmerich. Um, he's had like one or two movies between this one and his... Uh, 
uh, Independence Day. I think Midway wasn't terrible. I enjoyed Midway. That was uh, that was kind of one he did before Moonfall, but it was after Independence Day sequel. Um, it's just it's just a bad movie. Don't watch this one if you're really really interested. I'd say watch the highlights on YouTube, or if you have Netflix and you've got maybe an hour and a half to two hours to kill, and you're really bored, give it a shot, but don't expect much. This might be one to watch just to laugh at. Um, I'm trying to think of whether there are any other big problems with the movie I had. Ah, the Nile. Uh, of course, uh, there there's parts where they're sailing down the Nile. Um, the Nile is way, way too narrow. It's like you can, uh, in real life, the, the Nile is, is very wide. Um, also they have their sails up and I think they're sailing, I think they're sailing north. Um, you don't have to do that on the Nile. The Nile flows to the north. Um, and because of the way that it runs north-south and where it's situated in Africa, the prevailing winds actually go south. So you would only have your sails up if you were going south. Otherwise, you'd, you'd have your, you'd, you know, you're just sailing against the wind, essentially, if you have your sails up going north. You would have rowers, maybe like one or two um, rows, not like you know, not like one or two people. You would just have a few because you wouldn't need a lot to go to go upriver uh, with the Nile. Uh, that's kind of a big thing. I know that they're showing that these are really technologically advanced people, but anyway, it's just it's an odd. It's all around. I just there's so many problems with this. Just as it, even if you're not a historian, I think like there's a lot that would throw people off and say, "Is that right?" And I, I worry that someone's gonna watch this and they're gonna think that this, oh wow, this is this is real, and it just it makes me sick, or, you know. Or some stupid, you know, poor kid or stupid kid is gonna watch this and just be like, "Oh wow, so that was like in 10,000 BC." Um, oh, another thing, of course, speaking of technolog technological superiority, uh, there's metal. The, the bad guys have metal and armor. Uh, no, no, that's, uh, no, we're, we're not even, we don't even have copper yet, much less bronze or iron. Um, and then they, of course, they have gold jewelry, also not possible yet. Um. It's just, it's bad all around. <laughs> um, but yeah, so skip this one. Please don't watch it unless you're really, really bored or if you just want to make fun of it. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, well, that's it for this week. Um, happy bonus episode to everyone. Uh, I was going to do this movie anyway, eventually, um, but I decided to just go ahead and get it taken care of. Um, I have been working on the next couple of scripts for the main episode. I got actually a lot of work done this week. Uh, my real job has actually not been so hectic, and I haven't been worried about it, you know, after hours as I have the last two or three weeks. So I'm really, really got the juices flowing, and I'm looking forward to our first kind of out of Africa episodes um, at 10,000 BC. So. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this episode, and I hope you enjoy those future ones. Uh, please, if you are listening to me on any apps, please rate, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. Download, uh, tell your friends that might be interested. Um, and if you have any feedback, please reach out to me at waradrevpod at gmail.com. That's W A R A D R E V P O D at gmail.com. Or you can reach me at the Twitter account for the podcast, uh, which I will include a link in the description. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you have a great weekend. Goodbye.